So welcome to the um, Amocut website representing the Nord Sea Rex 2, um, which is here on the screen is the um, uh, landing page for amocat.org slash North Sea Rex, uh, from where we uh, have given a short general information about the rack. And uh, from here on the left top, you will be uh, redirected to the platform, the tool itself. So when you click on that link, you will come up in this login page. Um, the North Sea Rex tool is uh, um, open for the invitees of a workspace of the not Rex workspace, and um, as I said, this is um, protected for only invited users. Um, so here we can uh, log in. Let me quickly type this in. There we have it. And once you've logged in, um, you will come to the actual not Rex tool, which consists mostly of a a sort of a GIS based platform, i.e. an interactive map and on the left side you will see um, um, all the racks that you have. So going a bit to the details, here we see the racks which have been um, used for the project, which are the case studies which our partners have uh, been collecting data of. Uh, what we see here is that we've got um, the first um, um, uh, interested company also starting to put their own um, uh, racks in um, and what you see like uh, with the mouse cover you can go over the racks and see exactly where what rack is of course you've got them grouped so if you want to go a bit closer you can click on the group and you'll be redirected so you can navigate easily through the racks what we also have here on the map if we got a, uh, some zoom buttons to do this uh, the classical way let's say you can of course drag the map and here on the left top we can also zoom back to the original extent. So having the map visualized on the map, um, it's of course good to know also a bit more details about the rack. So what you have here, if we go to the racks, we see the names, and these names are repeated here on the left side. So here, for example, I have the Hendrik is in the UC30, all boats, all shipwrecks, which have been uh, surveyed during the North Sea Rex project and um, I said while going over these items you can of course see them highlight on the map so an easy way to simply go through all the uh, racks and the inspection of. Um, if we then take one example um, I was thinking of the UC30 which is a nice example for you to show to see. Um, if we're interested in this rack, we would like to maybe have a short click and there we get some information about the rack. We get some peripherals about the date of sinking, where it is located um, and um, some other uh, numbers where I will go into at a later stage. Um, and of course from here we can also go to the details. So if we have the details here, um, we can have a look at all the specifics of the wreck. This consists of a true story, so a written story about the history of the wreck. It contains factual data, being uh, sort of fields which are filled out, like the name, uh, where's the location, what country does it lie in, when did it sink, and more. Um, as I said, the wreck information. Then, apart from the general wreck information, which I just mentioned, we also got a field about the rack integrity saying something about the state of the rack in what state is this rack um, in addition we've got the munition and the fuel and the cargo this is an itemization to see what is still on board of this rack of hazardous substances in addition we've got a uh, the uh, chance of release, so this is more related to the risk module, the risk calculation, which we have got running in the background, meaning that the data that we have here is used to calculate risks. Yeah. At the same time, we can track samples, samples taken in the past, but also for the future, we can add samples. I'll tell you more about this in a few minutes. Um, furthermore, since we're dealing with something which has a spatial as well as a a, a temporal component, we've added a timeline, meaning that all the information being collected is put on a timeline to get a bit of a of a of a of, a, of an approximation of what the what the historical progression is. So we can, for example, have um, 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 the, the the date when the ship was commissioned. We also have the sinking date, but it can also go when we take samples or when certain observations were, when certain documents were published, etc. No. Furthermore, we can say something about the infrastructure nearby, which is automatically extracted from our database with spatial data sets. And uh, we've got 
a law section where <clears throat> based on the information of the rec we can determine which uh, legal documents so which conventions which laws which national laws international laws actually could apply to the rec yeah. so those are the sections that we've got covered in this rec database the data is for the project it has been um, delivered to us uh, via our partner from Working Package 3. That means that this information lies in a database um, at a third party uh, project partner and we get this information, we can read it and we put it here and we can display it so we can use this interface to actually work with that data um, and of course to work on the risk assessments. So if you look at them into, in specific, we've got the REC information. If we go to more, I can quickly go over it. We can see different fields, ship use, flag state, very important for the legal part. Uh, some technical and historical information, where was the ship built, what dimensions, etc. And of course here <clears throat> we've got a number of attached files. So we can attach files to any section and also find them back there again, being it about historical pictures, about drawings, about written documents. Um, uh, maybe also later for the sampling, if you get uh, pictures of the samples, etc. Yeah? And um, very simple, you can just click on the file. Um, some formats are supported for direct views, the other ones you can download, and they straight away have got the overview of that uh, file. Yes. Of course, if you want to edit, this data is pulled, so we cannot edit all the fields, but if you were to, for example, create a new rec, you can edit, of course, everything. Um, and then manage the information, meaning with the editing that anyone who is invited to this uh, workspace can actually contribute to the information provided of this rec. Yeah. If we then go back to the main view, um, of course, here we also see the map, which you can here add by a geotiff. If you've got a geotiff of the rec, you can add it and it will be located on the map so you can straight away see where your rec is and of course later also for example how you have the samples if you come to the rec integrity rec integrity is important because in the general information we describe what the rec is about um, what the history is now the description and um, uh, what kind of, of technical data we have the rec integrity gives us something about how did it come to sync and what state is it now and under what conditions is it currently uh, housed or like 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 laying there um, so this would for example deal the cause of sinking uh, of course it calculates how long it has been underwater which is important in terms of deterioration of the wreck um, how is it positioned um, uh, some maybe some dimensions that we have of the of the area um, we can give some simple characteristics on if sedimentation occurs scouring occurs scouring being the washing away of sand so the erosion and of course if you've got them both uh, then you sort of got a more or less of a stable seabed if you've got only sedimentation marks you tend to have um, the wreck being more covered with sediment over time and scour marks uh, is then of course if the current is high enough to 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 wash sediments away something like this um then you've got uh, is it a sea grave yes or no uh, is there illegal salvaging taking place is it known uh, so it is all information which is important for us to know on what this uh, wreck is subject to with the wreck site characteristics we also collect um two groups let's say the activities so what human activities occur at this moment around this wreck and we've got the indicators so the indicators give us something about what is the uh, um, uh, conditions of the wreck in terms of, of hydrography but also about the state of the wreck itself so for example the hull thickness if we get an indication how how thick the hull is of this of the of the, of the material of the ship yeah. uh, you can see that some numbers are automatically filled out so we get, for example, trawling numbers and shipping numbers. We've got salinity, depth, uh, current speeds, etc. These are all provided by underlying um, uh, spatial data sets. That means that any rec that you create, depending, of course, also a bit on the availability of the data. We don't have full coverage, but for example, for the German waters, for the Norwegian waters, uh, we've got uh, quite some data sets there where um, there's automatically information about the location of the wreck is already extracted considering the water depth the currents but also how much ship traffic takes place how much fishing takes place this is all already known and often 
um, not directly combined with the rack, but here we do this, so, so it, and it goes automatically. Um, so this is the rack integrity. Yeah, of course, you can also edit this if you want to, and you can set the different parameters. If the person who manages this rack, or if the, the, the uh, contributing organizations, if they've got better information, for example, we take a first assumption, and then when somebody goes there and says, like, look, we're going to measure a bit or we're going to do a bit of a study, we can narrow down these numbers. The more we narrow down these numbers, the more accurate we can later get with the risk assessment, which we will do for this REC. <clears throat> Apart from the REC integrity, we've also got the munition and the fuel and the cargo. Um, what does this do? Mostly based on historical uh, research, uh, what we do is we... Well, like what, what the historians do, what the contributors do, is they take on what can possibly be taken by the ship and make estimates, um, uh, in a way, a suspicion of what could still be on board. So this relates to, for example, for a new boat, you can say, like, look, it has so many torpedo tubes and it just left port, so we can assume that most of the torpedoes are still on board. And then we can quantify what kind of torpedoes they were, if there's five pieces, uh, so many kilograms of, of, of the charge being still on board, and this way we can quantify. And that's why we also chose to make a quantification of munition, but also of fuel and of cargo. So what you can simply do there is you can simply add an item, fill it out, give the number, and this makes it machine readable so we can start working with this information, which I will show you at a later stage. So what we have here, <coughs> From the munition, the fuel, and the cargo, we go to the chance of release. And the chance of release, this is the actual risk assessment which is taking place. It looks very small here because it's just the result. All the actual mathematics, all the actual model, the calculations take place in the background. So the user doesn't have to be too much involved in how the statistical method is applied. Um, the statistical method based on VRACA, which is a method used in uh, Sweden since 2016 to assess their recs and has proven quite um, successful to uh, calculate the chance of release being how likely is it that certain human activities will damage this wreck in such a way that we have uh, an adverse impact on the environment. Um, and this, of course, is then dependent on the amount of human activities that take place, the environmental conditions, and also the state of the wreck, which are considered there. So what it spews out, what it calculates is, in the end, the chance of release, which here is given in percentage, the statistical range, which indicates a bit like what the uncertainty is of the method here, um, and the individual um, um, uh, parts. Yeah. Here, of course, we've got illegal salvaging confirmed, which is not there, which is red, but here, of course, we can still indicate a range of what could be expected in illegal salvaging. So if you have 0 to 2, then you have 0 to 2 salvaging events per year, for example, which would result in a high uh, uh, probability that illegal salvaging will actually also damage this wreck in such a way that it gets broken. Salvaging meaning, of course, that you go there with, for example, a crane and you really start to take pieces of iron away from it. Um, I said these numbers are a bit fictional, so we've made some assumptions for this demonstration, which I will set back, but it shows a bit more how we can then determine what activity might um, have an impact on the actual damage of such a wreck. Um, the chance of release, the statistical range, I said it's theoretical numbers, but we will use them later because we use these numbers for every wreck. That means that we can start comparing these wrecks based on the wreck site characteristics and about the wreck properties themselves. So we can start having a look which wreck is most likely to have an adverse effect on the environment or on the activities which take place and hence could um, uh, be of a higher importance to take this wreck into consideration for, for example, further monitoring or remediation actions. If we go a bit further, we've got also the sampling area. Now, the sampling, <coughs> of course, when you collect data, you want to know more about the historical part, we want to know more about the surroundings, we do this theoretical check to see which wrecks are most important. Of course, you still have to confirm, do you have, for example, leaks of fuel, leaks of munition if it's on board? 
and to do so we've got this sampling module here we can see for the rec we've got 50 samples 167 analyses a uh, short background on this if you take a sample for example a bucket of water or a grab of sediment close or uh, um, near the rack. What you then do, you take this sample along, you bring it to the labor laboratory, and there you do an analysis. So you analyze, analyze for, for, for hydrocarbons, you can analyze for TNT, you can analyze for any substance. That means that one sample can have multiple numbers of analyses, let's say. So <clears throat> if we go there, we get a scene uh, a scene we call this uh, like a new a new screen in the end where we can list the samples and we can also add a sample and if you add a sample you can say it like okay it's it's a sample uh, x yeah and then you can give it a name it's a sediment sample water sample you can give it a depth a latitude let me quickly make this it's um, uh, the water depth of let's say uh, 19 meters latitude so we can say it's here on the map now we got a new sample, which is still being created now. It's collected from Simon. My name is Simon, by the way. Hello. Um, and here we have this. So now we've got the new sample. We can add it. And there our sample is sample X. We can go to the details and there we can add the analysis. So we can say, okay, we've got TNT. It's a subsample depth. If you take sediment, you can say, is it, for example, at 10 centimeters under the seafloor? Uh, and oh, we can give it some values. LOD means it's not really detected. LOQ means it is there, but we cannot um, uh, quantify it. And of course, if we can quantify it, we can give it a value, for example, one. And then it's, for example, a nanograms per gram or nanograms per kilo, whatever you have there. You can give a short description, sample has been analyzed in keel and blah 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 uh, something like this and then you can add it and then if we go to the sampling there's our sample and on the map we can have a look of course i put it a bit away from the rack it's sample x and there we can see we've got our tnt so this way on a very simple way we make this information accessible to anyone who has to work with it who is not taking the samples so people who take the samples can contribute can add this can keep monitoring and the only thing that we will notice is for example on the 27th of july that a sample has been taken on this location i get the number and i can make a judgment if this is critical or not <clears throat> and of course if you go then to what has been done in the North Sea Rex project, we see we took a lot of samples and um, um, there's been a lot of um, um, values being taken. Uh, most of them show very little in there, meaning that everything is sound. Some of them maybe jump out a bit. Um, all important to, to have a look on what kind of effects this has. Yeah? And as you can see, also the strategy on how these samples were taken nicely along the rack and some outside as a reference is um, uh, a good valuable information um, of course the information can also be checked in, in detail and there's also some descriptions we can get and I said we can get all the information there so that's a bit how the sampling works and um, there we have it so um, what have we got more if we go further we also get the timeline um, <clears throat> the timeline got important because we have the uh, impression like we got the impression throughout the project that um, especially the historical information on what what happens around the wreck it's the whole story it's just, just one number we can calculate it's not just one story about how the ship sank is there we really have to keep everything there from files from documents together with this information given here the risk assessment desampling and to bring this all together we got this timeline um, and along the timeline we can show everything which has been taken for example the sample we just added has also been added to the timeline so here we can see a bit what we have so if i'm as a historian interested in what happened around the wreck oh, there's some some oil leaks observed there's some samples taken on different times of the year yeah, even yesterday and the day before yesterday we took some samples i can have a look jump there and see the information so the timeline makes the information very accessible and brings sort of a historical context a bit more visible yeah. um, also of course we can make multiple notes so if you want to add a note to this we can say like look um, uh, observation 
observation X and the date of, well that was maybe a couple of years ago, 2001, um, and Simon found out that, Simon says, <laughs> that um, um, we had the divers observed at the wreck, something like this. Or maybe the divers themselves find if you go to a diving club and they might have dived there and they might have taken some pictures, this gives you information, for example. You can attach a file here so you can add that that's media etc and you save it and there you have it yeah. good then in addition we get uh, based on the location where we have it we can extract from existing data sets what's nearby this wreck so here we know that in the vicinity of three kilometers we've got a cable laying there what kind of a cable uh, not really known who owns it telegeography at least it's a submarine cable. So it depends a bit, of course, on what information is available in the data sets we, we tap. Um, but having that information there is already important. Then the last thing that we have here is the laws section. With the laws, we look at uh, where is the ship line? Who owns the ships? Under which flag state did it come? How was the ship used? In what zone? In what country does it lie? Is it a, um, a war grave, etc.? All this information is used to go through a list of available laws, conventions, recommendations um, to check under what circumstances to what conditions this law applies so this way we can use the rec information to already select a list of possible conventions laws etc which could apply to this rec yeah so it could be a few it could be just more but um, um it, it gives you may, uh, an idea of what what areas you have to keep an eye on um, and it gives you a link to it there so this is also dynamic is different for each rec and uh, is created uh, there so, having enough said about the rec, we've been there already a bit uh, on the way, but I think this gives a good uh, view. Of course, if you have the collection of, of all the information here, uh, you get some files uploaded here, some files uploaded here, some files uploaded in the other section, that means um, you also get a lot of files, so we get a sort of a file manager, where here we also see everything that has been uploaded and there you see we've got a bachelor report here, we've got some TFs, we've got a little video, we've got uh, some pictures. I said some of them are shown, some we can download and then show. Um, um, and this uh, sort of gives you, let's say, the added part of I said most of the researchers, most of the people working with these racks, they work with files. So you've got the option to also um, um, have put their files there and also share them then this way with other users. So if we then go back to the main map, we've got our UC30 here. And now it's a bit like, okay. How do we do the prioritization? Well, as we said, uh, automatically we calculate a risk for each rack. And these are the numbers which you see here, the chance of release. We've got the amount of substances provided with the rack. So based on these numbers, we can, of course, then start listing. Uh, so what you can do, you can check, for example, based on the chance of release. So this is just the probability that a wreck gets damaged. It doesn't say anything about the risk. It just says about how likely is it that a wreck gets damaged and that a possible opening could occur. Um, and this, as I said, depends on how deep the water is, how many currents, uh, how, how, what's the shipping, how much fishing takes place. This all affects the number of how likely it is that a wreck actually gets affected and damaged. If nothing happens, no human activities, it's just deterioration, deteriora deterioration sorry, and this deterioration is affected by its salt, oxygen, uh, currents. Yeah? But if you then start adding human activities, you will have an elevated increase that the wreck gets damaged and hence could leak. Yeah? So this is the chance of release. However, if you've got a wreck and you've got a high chance that something gets released, but if there's no harmful substances on board, no fuel, no cargo, no uh, UXO, so no, no, no marine munitions, then basically, the, at least for the environment, the risk is sort of very low. So that means that the chance of release does not equal the risk here. Yeah. The more um, um, uh, hazardous substances you would have on board, the higher the risk would be for the environment to actually start leaking into. Um, but there's of course also a bit of a catch, as in like if you've got a wreck with a very high probability but very little amount of hazardous substances versus a wreck which has got a 
a large amount of toxic substances, but maybe a relatively low chance of release, which one to take? And this is always a dilemma, and this is exactly what this prioritization does. Uh, it works with the product, so it works with the product of, of the chance of release and the substances. So what you then get is you get the risk. So you can, for example, then uh, make a prioritization based on the total risk. So what you get then is you get a rack with a, a large amount of substances. Here we talk mostly about fuel and mostly about um, 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 coal. And you would have um, <clears throat> a percentage of the chance of release and together the product of this makes the risk. That means that then you've got the, uh, the for example, the second ship, which has got still a large amount of, of, of substances on board, but a very low chance of release. But since the high amount of substances is there, it ranks up high. But there you see that, for example, you got a ship with a much higher chance of release, but fewer substances, they go down a bit lower in the packing order. Uh, this can be done for uh, the total risk, but since we also collect information about munition and about fuel individually, we can also make the risks for the different categories, let's say, we can calculate them. So we've got different ways to prioritize the whole um, uh, risk, which makes it a tool, so you can start working with the information. Do we provide with this a definite list with the risks of which rack is most important? No, this is up to the user because the user will work with these racks, it will add documentation, and this, this list is dynamic and can manage what he or she has to keep in mind. And if you say, look, I've got a rack which jumps up very high because of the initial data that we provide, this one is very important, and we've got a high amount of X, X substances there, then he can decide to say, look, I'm gonna take this rack, I'm gonna take the first 10 racks, and I'm gonna use these to uh, do some monitoring just send a ship out and collect more information or do a desktop study and find out that. And this way, it becomes sort of active. So then of the, let's say, hundreds or thousands of rec, they might limit it down to maybe 100 or maybe 10 or maybe 20, and the one on top of the list he or she can manage. And then maybe at a later stage, depending also on what um, um, the, the users in the end what would like to have, we can also start adding remediation steps. So we can say, like, look, okay, you've got your rec, you're tracking this, you're adding your information. Now, have you planned something to do to monitoring or to, to, to do a, a mitigation or maybe to, to, to bring in other experts? I don't know. It's, um, it's a system which can have um, a lot of potential for the different users to start working with the recs. So, um, yeah, basically this was the um, Nazi Rex risk assessment tool, uh, which has been created through the Nazi Rex uh, project. I'd like to thank all the um, partners of the consortium and also um, of, of Interreg to make this project uh, possible. And I think this has got a good future ahead um, for an actual use on an expanded scale. So thank you.